Hello and welcome to Simply Scottish, the long-running podcast of Scottish music and culture. I'm your host, Andrew McDermott. Today we're going back into Scottish history to illuminate the story of the Covenanters, the Scots who fought to defend their religious freedom in the 17th century. You've likely heard the story of the Puritans of England who sailed to the New World on the Mayflower and other ships in search of a new home and the freedom to worship. But do you know the stirring and often sad tale of the Covenanters? We'll get to that, but right now let's continue listening to the combined sounds of the French accordion and the Scottish fiddle. This is Tans 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 by Kate and Raphael. start today's episode by saying hello to folks that have gotten in touch with me recently. First, I heard from Dawn, co-host of the true crime podcast Scottish Murders. She's interested in finding other Scottish podcasts out there who are willing to collaborate with each other. Dawn, I'd be happy to team up. I like a good murder mystery every now and then, what with the countless British detective books and TV shows that are out there. A few of my favourites include the Welsh production Hinterland, Oxford-based Endeavour, the savvy and cheeky detective Vera, and of course Shetland, filmed in and around Larrick off the northern coast of Scotland. I also heard from Mary via the Simply Scottish blog. She's interested in gaining clarity about her ancestors, the MacAndrews, who escaped Scotland after Culloden and settled in Pennsylvania and Ohio. She probably found my article, Where Did All the Highlanders Go?, which has remained popular online since I wrote it back in 2013. Mary, thanks for writing. Finally, Dungaree in Texas left a five-star review of the podcast on the Apple Podcasts platform, saying, With a mix of music, history, culture and charm, Simply Scottish brings a down-to-earth view of Scotland, both past and present. 
The podcast also helps me get thinking about my next trip to Scotland. Well, Dungaree, thank you very much for the positive review, and I hope you can make it to Scotland again soon. Let me know if you uh, need any tips or advice. I know I'm starting to get the itch to go back there as well. Well, listeners, it's your turn now to get in touch with me. Tell me where in the world you're listening from and what you love about Scotland. Email me at andrew at simplyscottish.com. That's andrew at simplyscottish.com. And if you can hop on to Apple Podcasts and leave a review and rating, it really helps me reach new listeners. By the way, if you enjoyed my recent podcast episode titled Why We Need Robert Burns in 2022, you'll want to read my companion article on how I think Scotland's national poet can save us from civil war in today's day and age. It's already up at the website American Greatness, but you can also read it starting the first week of April 2022 on the website of the Scottish Banner, the Scottish community's largest international newspaper for expat Scots, or those with an interest in Scottish culture and tradition. Find it at www.scottishbanner.com. I recently pulled off my Scottish bookshelves, a book by 19th century Scottish author Henrietta Elizabeth Marshall. She is well known for her works of history written especially for children. She wrote Our Island Story, a history of England for boys and girls, in 1905, and she followed that in 1906 with Scotland's Story, a history of Scotland for boys and girls. Her chapters concerning the plight of the Scottish Covenanters caught my attention. It inspired me to take another look at this chapter of Scottish history, with an eye to how it might inform us in our own times. I'll be reading a little bit from Marshall's book later in this episode. My family immigrated to the United States in 1990, and though I still cherish my homeland of Scotland, I owe a debt of gratitude and allegiance to America. I've also grown to fully appreciate in recent years the freedoms America secures for its citizens and residents. One of those freedoms is the freedom of religion. In the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, it states that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. To fully appreciate the wording of this simple statement and see why America's founders thought it necessary to include it, it's important to know why it was written and the history that inspired it. Why did the founders think it was good to forbid the new American government from establishing a particular religion, or interfering with the people's free exercise of religion? Well, a first clue can be found in the Virginian Declaration of Rights of 1776, which is considered a model for the Bill of Rights. Thomas Jefferson borrowed many ideas and phrases from the Virginia Declaration. Concerning religion, it reads, that as religion, or the duty which we owe to our divine and omnipotent creator, and the manner of discharging it, can be governed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence, and therefore that all men should enjoy the fullest toleration in the exercise of religion, according to the dictates of conscience, unpunished and unrestrained by the magistrate, unless, under color of religion, any man disturb the peace, the happiness, or safety of society, or of individuals, and that it is the mutual duty of all to practice Christian forbearance, love, and charity towards each other. So why protect the people's right to freedom of religion? Well, in short, that freedom is worth protecting, and it came at a great price. The Puritans, a sect of the Church of England, left for Holland and the New World in the early 17th century due to religious persecution. But what about the plight of the Scots? First, let me give you a little context. German teacher and monk Martin Luther challenged the Catholic Church's teachings in 1517. That was the spark that set off the Reformation in Europe. Luther also translated the Bible into the German language. In 1526, copies of William Tyndale's translation of the New Testament into the language of the Plowman, English, began trickling into Britain. It was outlawed. Thousands of copies of it were burned by officials. Men and women, first among them Patrick Hamilton and St. Andrews, were burned alive at the stake. His crime? Affirming that sacraments cannot save. In a time of great corruption and degradation in the Scottish Church, evangelicals like Hamilton wanted people to know that their salvation came from Christ, 
not the church. The gospel was not commonly known in Scotland before the Reformation. Brave Scottish reformers like George Wishart and John Knox committed their lives to reaching all Scots with the message of salvation. Eventually, Protestantism would prevail in Britain. In 1560, the Treaty of Edinburgh confirmed Scotland as a reformed Protestant nation. The Scottish Confession of Faith and Book of Church Discipline were also written that year. But starting with Mary, Queen of Scots, in 1561, the relationship between church and state, and between the state of affairs in Scotland and England, was often strained. This is the period we're taking a closer look at today, particularly the attempts to control the governance of the church in the countries of Great Britain between the Union of the Crowns in 1603 and the Union of the Parliaments in 1707. So much history. It can be mind-boggling, but really interesting, and very relevant to modern life. I personally love diving into history, and I have books surrounding me in my office here, but I know it can be tough for, for people just to, to follow along, so I've tried to streamline it as best I can and just weave a thread through all of this, this complicated history and make it rather simple to, uh, to grasp. We'll continue with that in a few minutes. But first, new music from Bradley Parker, a finalist for the BBC Radio Scotland Young Musician of the Year in 2021. Featuring Bradley's bagpipes and whistle, this is Journey. Thank you. 
You're listening to Simply Scottish. On this episode, we're taking a trip back in time to the tumultuous years of the 17th century to gain a better understanding of the importance of religious liberty. In 1603, James VI of Scotland was offered the English throne after the death of Queen Elizabeth. As great-grandson to Henry VII, he was the rightful heir. James VI of Scotland became James I of England, and he moved his court to London to continue his rule. Now, James never cared for the Church of Scotland, the Presbyterian Church. Once in England, he aligned himself with the Episcopalians. The Scottish Reformed Church had a very different tradition from the English. It had emerged in spite of the crown, not thanks to it. And that tradition persisted, despite James's efforts. In 1625, James VI died, and his son Charles I became king. Although Charles was born a Scot, he left there at age three and didn't return until eight years into his reign. He had little understanding of Scottish affairs or opinion, and like his father, had low regard for democratic institutions like the Presbyterian system of church governance. He also, like his father, believed in the divine right of kings. Soon, Charles was forcing acts through Parliament that curtailed the liberties of the people. Eventually, he worked with the Archbishop of Canterbury on a new prayer book that was more similar to the Roman Catholic Mass book than the English prayer book. Without consulting the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish people, he required all Scottish churches to begin using his new prayer book. The Scots didn't take kindly to this royal intrusion into their distinct style of worship and preaching. Riots and protests ensued, including a notable incident at St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, incidentally where my mother and father got married. A beautiful church with lots of interesting history. Soon after a riot broke out there during the reading of the king's new prayer book, plans were made to draw up a covenant, signed by nobles and commoners alike. That signaled a rejection of the divine right of kings in favour of man's duty to God. Here's how Henrietta Marshall puts it in her book Scotland's Story. On the first day of March 1638, in Greyfriars Churchyard in Edinburgh, the National Covenant was first signed. The paper was spread out upon a flat gravestone, and noble after noble wrote his name. After them came ministers, gentlemen, tradesmen, and people of all ranks, high and low. Never was there such excitement. Many wept as they wrote their names. Others cut themselves and signed in their own blood. Afterwards, noblemen and gentlemen carried copies of the covenant with them all over the country, till thousands of names were added to the list. The Covenanters, as these Protestants were now called, sent a letter to King Charles. They called it their great supplication. Supplication means humble prayer. It was sent back to them with the seal unbroken. The king had refused even to read it. It was to be war then. The whole country was ready for it. In every town and village the rattle of firearms and the tramp of men was heard as the people gathered and drilled for the defence of their religion. At last a great army was encamped upon a hill called Dun's Law. Their leader was Sir Alexander Leslie, a little old crooked soldier with the heart of a giant and the courage of a lion. Before the tent of each captain fluttered a banner with the rampant Lion of Scotland and the motto, For Christ's Crown and Covenant. But after all, there was no fighting. At the last moment, Charles gave way. He promised the Covenanters the freedom they asked for, and they sent their soldiers to their homes again. But alas, this isn't the end of the story for the Covenanters. The National Covenant was written to be a defense of Protestantism, of a distinctly Presbyterian church, a defense of laws already passed, a defense of Christ as head of the church, not the king. It also defended the monarch's ability to govern the temporal, earthly realm. Charles fought against the Covenanters, but eventually surrendered to them in 1645, refusing to grant freedom in matters of religion to the Scots and English. He was taken prisoner by the English, and eventually executed. For a time, England was done with kings. Instead, a general named Oliver Cromwell took over affairs, establishing a commonwealth with stern but peaceful rule. He wasn't a big fan of the Covenanters. After he died, Charles II returned to rule. This Charles had no intention of upholding the Covenant. He brought bishops back and required all ministers in Scotland to adhere to Episcopalian governance. 
About 300 ministers, or a third of the total, refused in Scotland, and their congregations followed them. They began holding illegal services in homes, barns, and in the wild hills and glens, armed and on the lookout for troops. Fines and armed clashes began, and the harsher the government responded, the more stubborn the covenanters got. These years became known as the killing time, for much blood was shed between the covenanters and the forces raised against them by the king. In 1685, Charles II died and was succeeded by his brother James VII, a despot intent on continuing the persecution of the Covenanters. Then, in 1688, the Glorious Revolution, an almost bloodless revolution that saw Mary, the eldest daughter of King James, become queen and her husband, William of Orange, king. Those in the Highlands who remained loyal to James and the Stuarts were known as Jacobites. The Highlanders made William's government uneasy, so much so that they conspired to make an example out of one sept of the clan MacDonald, in a tragedy known as the Massacre of Glencoe. One good that came out of William's reign was a settlement reached in 1690, abolishing bishops, re-adopting the Westminster Confession, and re-establishing the Presbyterian system in Scotland. The Covenanters had at long last secured religious liberty, with their own blood, a legacy that lives on today. Here's Alan Reed of Battlefield Band fame with Rob Van Sant singing a song about the Covenanters. Covenanter, your sword and your Bible by your side. The riders and the forces of the king are close behind. If they take you, you're sure to be a martyr. You'd better be prepared to meet your maker, Covenanter. This land is riven by descent For some adhere to royalty And some to parliament And some proclaim the covenant An oath they can disdain They're not constrained by loyalty or honour The horsemen took you by surprise Your sentries never saw them For the sun was in their eyes They rode among the worshippers And drew their swords above them And you fled amid confusion and disorder Covenanter Your sword and your Bible by your side The riders and the forces of the king are close behind If they take you You're sure to be a martyr You'd better be prepared to meet your maker Covenanter And now the hunt is on You can see the lanterns flickering and dancing in the wind And you hear the cry of triumph And your heart is beating faster For you know another brother has been cornered Covenanter Your sword and your Bible by your side The riders and the forces of the king are close behind If they take you, you're sure to be a martyr You'd better be prepared to meet your maker, Covenant. Try not to stumble on a stone. If it tumbles and betrays you, you'll surely be undone. And you'll know about their justice when you're staring at their steel. They'll be laughing while you're sent to the hereafter. Covenanter Your sword and your Bible by your side 
The riders and the forces of the king are close behind. If they take you, you're sure to be a martyr. You'd better be prepared to meet your maker, Covenanter. Now the darkness is your friend. And you wonder when this desperate hide and seek will ever end. If the mist would just descend for once and let you slip away, you'd escape the retribution and the slaughter. Covenanter, your sword and your Bible by your side. The riders and the forces of the king are close behind. If they take you, you're sure to be a martyr. You'd better be prepared to meet your maker, Covenanter. 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 It's very likely that many of America's founders were familiar with Scottish documents like the National Covenant of 1638 and the Declaration of Arbroath back in 1320. Indeed, a word-for-word comparison shows that the United States Declaration of Independence and the preamble to the Constitution bear some striking resemblance in word and concept. For example, comparing the preamble to the Constitution and the National Covenant, an act ordaining it, we can see some similarities. Listen. We, the people of the United States, we noblemen, barons, gentlemen, burgesses, ministers, and commons, in order to form a more perfect union, considering the great happiness which may flow from a full and perfect union, establish justice, ministration of justice among us, ensure domestic tranquility, procure true and perfect peace. Provide for the common defense to the mutual defense and assistance every one of us of another. Secure the blessings of liberty, the peace of the kingdom for the common happiness of ourselves and posterity. Do ordain and establish this constitution. Ordain the covenant with this declaration. You can see some very similar wording there. So what does it all mean? While one could say that we're living through a new age of intolerance today. At such a time, it's helpful to look back at the history of freedoms we enjoy today and often take for granted, and get a new appreciation for them and a new commitment towards them. We should always be at the ready to defend religious freedom, both in America and in every freedom-loving country in the world. Because as the Virginia Declaration of Rights of 1776 said, our religion the duty which we owe to our Creator, and the manner of discharging it, can be governed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. Well, that's it for this episode. If you enjoyed the program today, hop onto Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star rating and written review. You can also visit simplyscottish.com for show notes on this episode and others, and get in touch with your questions and comments anytime at my email address, Andrew at simplyscottish.com We'll close with music from Iona Fife from her album Away From My Window This is The Gentle Lullaby and So Must We Rest Join me again soon for your next virtual trip to Scotland Until then, I'm Andrew McDermott Thanks for listening Simply Scottish is hosted and produced by Andrew McDermott Show content, copyright, Simply Scottish Media. All music is used with consent of copyright holders. Continue your Simply Scottish experience at simplyscottish.com. Thanks for listening. The wind will still blow, the world is still turning, somewhere exotic, the sun is still burning. But here the night's falling, and so must we rest. Your head by my heart, gently pressed to my breast. The whispering ocean, with tall tales to tell, is done for the day.
And old Mother Moon with her pale, peaceful light keeps watch from above as she sings us good night. Good night, good night, oh my children, good night. Sleep deeply, sleep safely, my children, sleep. Thank you.